लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन नमस्कार वेलकम टू द फिफ्टीन एडिशन ऑफ द जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डेट ऑल बनेगा स्वस्थ इंडिया एंड बैंक ऑफ एट द बैंक ऑफ बड़ौदा टेंट वी आर डिलाइटेड टू इंट्रोड्यूस फ्रीडम टू नेविगेट सिक्योरिटी एंड इकोनॉमिक्स इन इंडो पैसेफिक दैट्स द सेशन and what it's about is can like minded nations stay together to protect a rule based global order growing prc assertion in the indo in indo pacific region has given new legs to partnerships in the region vigorous cooperation in areas like 5g networks semiconductors cyber security etc have real potential Ambassador Navdeep Suri discusses the Indo-Pacific Quad and beyond with charge the affairs Patricia Lesina Australian High Commissioner to India His Excellency Barry O'Farrell former sorry His Excellency Barry O'Farrell former Indian diplomat and 32nd Foreign Secretary of India Vijay Gokhale and the deputy british high commissioner to india jan thompson barry o'farrell was announced as australia's high commissioner to india in feb 2020 he served in the parliament of new south wales from 1995 to 2015 and as the state's 43rd premier between 2011 and 2014 as premier mr farrell Mr O'Farrell initiated and led annual trade missions to India to promote economic cultural and social links between New South Wales and the states of India he also served as NSW special envoy for India and has made a significant contribution as the deputy chair of Australia India Council board Mr O'Farrell has a bachelor of arts from the Australian National University Canberra Mr Vijay Gokhale joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1981 and his diplomatic assignments included Hong Kong, Hanoi, Beijing, New York and Taipei. Gokhale has been India's high commissioner to Malaysia from Jan 2010 to October 2013, ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany from October 2013 to January 2016 and ambassador to the People's Republic of China from january 2016 to october 2017 patricia a career member of the senior foreign service class of minister counselor assumed the role of charge the affairs for the us mission to india in september 2021 from july 2018 until july 2000 june july 2021 she served as consul general at the us consulate in frankfurt germany from 2015 to 2017 she served as principal deputy executive secretary to the office of the secretary of state from 2013 to 15 she served as deputy chief information officer for business management and planning and chief knowledge officer her overseas assignments include management officer in cairo deputy director of the frankfurt regional support center and director of human resources in vienna and brussels Jan Thompson served as Deputy High Commissioner acting High Commissioner to India in August 2018 and before that was ambassador to the Czech Republic her previous postings include Canada Germany and New York Thompson was the UK's lead climate change negotiator she likes traveling the world and is a semi professional actress with a particular passion for Shakespeare Uh, Navdeep Suri is a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. He has previously served as India's ambassador to UAE, High Commissioner to Australia, ambassador to Egypt and Consul General in Johannesburg. He also held diplomatic assignments in Tanzania, the United Kingdom, the United States and has headed the Africa and Public Diplomacy departments of India's Ministry of External Affairs. after acclaimed translations of his grandfather nanak singh's novel pavitra papi as watchmaker and ad khidiya pul 
as a life incomplete, he has worked on Khuni Vesaki, a long poem written by Nanak Singh in 1920 after surviving the Jallianwala massacre. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. So we've got an exceptionally distinguished panel and a wonderful audience. Uh, I can see that there are people standing at the back today um, to discuss a topic, the Indo-Pacific, that we never spoke about until about five years back. Um, the Quad has come its, into its own uh, to deal with some of the new challenges of security and economics in the Indo-Pacific. And again, uh, it's something that was kind of limping around for almost two decades uh, as an organization trying to seek a purpose in life uh, until the friendly Chinese came across and uh, uh, got everybody together. Uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, um, Barry's good friend Rory Metcalf at uh, the National Security College has uh, created a, uh, a thesis out of uh, the importance of middle-level regional powers coming together to uh, face this uh, great emerging hegemon in, in, in our part of the world. Um, Barry, I wanted to start with you that Australia has really been at the receiving end of um, China's wrath in the most unusual way. Um, the Australian Prime Minister made the uh, mistake of asking for an international inquiry into the origins of the Wuhan virus. And, and the reaction in Beijing was apoplectic, um, and, and, and uh, dire consequences were uh, uh, threatened uh, to Australia. I was surprised to see a Pew Opinion poll on how quickly, how far Chinese uh, popularity has sunk in Australia, uh, you know, maybe down to 21 or 22 percent of people who now have a positive view of China. Can you give us an Australian perspective on What's happened in the last few years that has made Australia, which was, um, if I can uh, rustle up some painful memories, uh, a former Australian prime minister was the one who sunk the quad at one point of time. Uh, and, and now it's, uh, Australia is one of the most active partners. <clears throat> Thanks, Navdeep. And firstly, can I say that you've been listening to Chinese misinformation because uh, uh, Australia's request to the WHO was simply to ensure that uh, it reviewed how it responded early to the COVID disease because we all know that one day there'll be another pandemic and we move that resolution, we argue that resolution to hope that uh, the body can be fit for purpose the next time it's needed. So it wasn't specifically about Wuhan, it wasn't specifically about Chinese eating cricket bats. It wasn't any of those things. Uh, it was it was about the, it was about the purpose. Just, but but the point that I would I would make now deep more seriously is you're you're right. Um, India has been subjected to uh, coercion at your borders, which I'd have to say is far more serious um, than the economic coercion that uh, China has sought to inflict on Australia. Um, that's what has helped unite Australians to have such a poor attitude towards China. Um, I'm the neophyte on this panel. You know from my CV, I'm not a trained diplomat, so I can say anything, and probably will. Uh, but, but, but the point is that uh, I don't understand why China is taking this posture to the world. This week, they criticised us for being a member of the Five Eyes Intelligence Partnership. They criticised us for being a, a member of the quadrilateral dialogue, the Quad. Uh, they criticised us uh, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, other things as well. They've criticised in the past for free speech, free media and parliamentary democracy. The fact is that, that the Quad, uh, the Five Eyes, uh, AUKUS uh, uh, partnership are all defensive mechanisms bringing like-minded countries together to, de to, to maintain and defend the status quo and uphold the rules-based international order that served us all well. I don't understand, Navdeep, why China is doing what it's doing, but I do know that the Quad uh, and similar uh, strategically aligned uh, interest-related uh, groupings, uh, as Jai Shankar argued in his India Way book, is clearly the future, 
uh, because that's the only way in which we're going to stand up and ensure that those who seek to coerce suffer come some consequence. Sure, and Patricia, uh, you know, um, it was quite unexpected for us in Delhi or maybe our friends in Canberra uh, that within weeks of President Biden coming into uh, power, uh, within weeks of being sworn in, he uh, first had a virtual summit of the Quad, uh, and then he had the first in-person uh, summit in Washington, D.C., where the leaders traveled despite COVID fears, et cetera, uh, to show their uh, commitment. Uh, there have been concerns over the last few weeks uh, um, articulated in India and elsewhere that does the preoccupation with Ukraine, uh, the focus once again on uh, European affairs, uh, mean that the pivot to uh, Indo-Pacific is being somehow uh, interrupted? Um, or, or is it going to be still business as usual? Uh, there was this... Um, uh, interesting news report about a cable going out from the State Department uh, uh, saying that India is a friend of Russia, uh, which was at odds with all of the, uh, the, the uh, efforts from the Indian side and from the American side to build the strategic partnership. And of course, then we saw statements from the uh, uh, State Department, I think, which were far more understanding of the Indian position. Uh, so I wanted to propose this to you. Does the U.S. remain focused on the Indo-Pacific despite what's going on in, in, in Ukraine, et cetera? Is there a change in the position that you see? Uh, that's a, can you hear me okay? So that's an excellent question. I think that many people have raised that. If they haven't raised it, they have wondered about that. Uh, I've heard it from, from several different people. But I think you just have to look at the facts, the fact that we are sitting here today, senior diplomats, you're a diplomat, Barry, come on, um, discussing the Indo-Pacific, the fact that the US has just released the Indo-Pacific strategy, the fact that they had a leader's call just last week, uh, that ministers met in Australia uh, very recently, all of those things, uh, point to the fact that we do have a real focus on the Indo-Pacific. And I, I think, I, you know, it bears pointing out that the U.S. is an Indo-Pacific country. I mean, we, this, is, this is our backyard. And we are very cognizant of the fact that we cannot, we cannot um, maintain prosperity and promote security in this region by ourselves. And we need partners like our partners in the Quad and additional partners like ASEAN and, and other countries to, to make this work. Um, and I think that the fact that we continue to promote um, uh, cooperation, whether it's uh, vaccines, to, to um, try to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic, or whether it's, as Barry said, we're doing something to try and, and prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. You know, all of these things we cannot do by ourselves. Um, we haven't even gotten into, you know, climate change and the things that, that we're trying to work together on, green energy. All of those things need group participation. And the reality is that, that the Indo-Pacific has, uh, you know, many flourishing democracies and nascent democracies, and, and we want to partner with them to make this a strong and prosperous and secure and resilient area of the world. Absolutely. And um, Jan, uh, UK, which is, of course, not a member of the Quad, suddenly made its appearance uh, on the scene uh, uh, when uh, literally at the midnight hour, uh, a new alliance was announced, a new uh, military uh, uh, organization uh, was announced in the form of AUKUS. Australia, UK, and the US coming together in this um, inelegantly formed <laughs> grouping, uh, which of course had the French going into a tizzy because uh, they were unhappy that they'd been blindsided by the, by the uh, developments. What has uh, led UK, which until a couple of years back 
was very big on its trading relationship with China, was very big on the whole fact that it's a win-win for both countries, um, was even taking Chinese companies on board for its 5G network, etc. What's changed for UK? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm actually, uh, I, I had kind of thought I was the interloper on this platform because um, it was about the quad and I thought, does he think I'm Japan? Um, but uh, now I kind of get the point, um, so that's good. Um, yeah, so I think for the UK, one thing you have to kind of bear in mind, a kind of different perspective the UK is coming from is that we Brexited, so we left the European Union. Um, and as we did that, we took a really hard look at our foreign policy, our security policy, our defense policy, our overseas interests. And it was very clear that we needed to be investing more in the Indo-Pacific. Um, that this was an area of, you know, a region of increasing geostrategic importance, half the world's population, half of global economic output. By 2030, it'll be 40% of global GDP critical to sea lanes, all the rest of it. Um, so we did what we called an Indo-Pacific tilt um, to kind of focus, sorry, could you hear me okay? Yeah, I had to focus more on the, this region um, in a whole, whole load of areas. And that was why, for example, we were looking for ASEAN dialogue partner status. We were looking to join CPTPT, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, free trade agreements in the world. And it's also why, by the way, we have really invested a great deal more in our relationship with India, which is critical in this region, a pivot state in a whole load of areas. Um, and, uh, and of course, there also we're looking to negotiate a free trade agreement um, as quickly as we can. So that's kind of a bit of the context. Um, and to come on to your question on AUKUS, um, you know, so elegantly named, um, Australia, UK, US, AUKUS, um, yeah, it uh, should be, I think it should be seen in that context. And it's a very, very tangible for us. It's a concrete demonstration of our commitment to the stability, the security of this region. And as you were alluding to, it's a contested region, a lot of contested interests here. Um, and uh, and it's, an and it's something we can do together with two partners, Australia, the US, who are you know, w with whom we have a relationship of deep, deep trust um, and a lot of shared interests in open democracies, the free world, um, seeing security there. Um, so it's, you know, it's going to be a range of things. It's uh, collaborating on nuclear-powered um, submarines for the Royal Australian Navy, nuclear-powered, not uh, nuclear-armed, by the way. Um, and it is also looking in a second phase at collaboration across a load of... Um, technologies um, which you know are, are growing in geostrategic importance I think and geopolitical importance um, and to come to your question on China um, yeah this is this is not kind of about this is not AUKUS um, and certainly our engagement in the Indo-Pacific is not against something it's not against China it's for something it's for a free and secure and stable region it's for protecting our interests, working with our partners for their stability too. So that's kind of how we come at that. The wonderful thing about being a former diplomat as opposed to a serving diplomat is that you can actually say things that you couldn't uh, uh, earlier. So, and, and the wonderful thing about the Quad architecture is that nowhere in any text, in any statement, do you see the C word. Uh, uh, it's the elephant in the room that is invisible, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's there certainly uh, to focus minds and uh, attentions. I saved uh, Vijay for the last because he has spent years and years studying China and the Chinese. He's fluent in Mandarin language. And Vijay, I wanted you to give us a little insight into what's happening in China. What's the Chinese mind? What is Xi Jinping's mind that within a short span of time, uh, they've moved from growing quietly to muscle flexing on an industrial scale uh, uh, with the uh, uh, issues in Hong Kong, in South China Sea, in Taiwan, uh, in, with India, with Japan, et cetera, et cetera. Are they doing it prematurely? Uh, have they uh, bitten off too much too soon? Um, what's your read on, on the Chinese? Yeah. Thanks, Navdeep. I think uh, we tend to attribute all this to the current Chinese president. But we forget that China has been quietly rising for at least 30 years. 
And a lot of what we see as happening in China today uh, is because of the foundation laid by President Xi Jinping's predecessors. Uh, the only difference is that after the global financial crisis, the Chinese have, rightly or wrongly, come to the conclusion that we are going to see a once-in-a-century change and that that change somehow involves the decline of the West and the rise of China. And I guess the global financial crisis and the coronavirus have uh, given uh, sort of an, an encouragement to the Chinese because in each instance they think the West has faltered and China has gained. Now, of course, the, the Ukraine crisis is going to have a very fundamental impact on uh, not just China, but on the Indo-Pacific. Because uh, if there was an expectation that Russia would prevail quickly, I think that sense is now disappearing. Uh, so for China, I think the critical objective is the survivability of Putin's government. Uh, it's the best government they can have which will ensure China's regime security. Any government that comes other than Putin from their perspective, will be more accommodative to Europe and the West and therefore less accommodative to the Chinese. And that's going to have ramifications uh, in the security of the Indo-Pacific. So I think the Chinese are watching developments in Ukraine very closely and their activities in the Indo-Pacific, and I don't mean Taiwan, I mean the Indo-Pacific in general, uh, are going to, to be greatly influenced by that. And I just want to point out two or three things. Uh, if they, if they do help in keeping the current Russian government in power, by whichever means. They will expect the current Russian government to come much more strongly in support of their version that the Indo-Pacific is the Asian version of NATO. So you're going to now face a Russo-Chinese uh, condominium. Uh, that's the first point. And the second point is that uh, if you saw the press conference the Chinese foreign minister gave uh, uh, last week, he basically linked the five eyes that uh, Barry referred to, Quad and AUKUS. Uh, in other words, uh, I think it's quite clear now where, in which camp they put India. And there's going to be a full throttle pushback. And that has a whole lot of ramifications for the security, not only of the Indo-Pacific, but for India as well, which we have to think through. So in a nutshell, I think, uh, while uh, the jury is still out on what's going to happen in, in uh, the Ukraine crisis, and I presume the Chinese jury is out as well, we should be anticipating what will happen in the Indo-Pacific if uh, a settlement is reached and uh, the Putin government continues to remain in power in Russia. So in the hypothetical, utterly hypothetical situation that were you the foreign secretary, uh, <laughs> would, 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 would you say that we should uh, be accommodative towards uh, China or would we be more uh, better off strengthening our relationships with the Quad members uh, and other uh, like-minded countries, including France and UK? Well, I think that there have been substantial efforts made from the Indian side to reach out. Uh, these have been for one reason or another either not seen as genuine or sincere or simply rejected. Uh, I think we need to recognize the fact that uh, China does not see anybody in Asia as an equal. And it seems to think that Indians don't have any agency in taking a decision. Either we are uh, being manipulated by the West or by the United States or by Russia or somebody else. I guess if that's the mindset they are coming with, uh, it makes sense for us to, to uh, uh, come on a similar platform with other countries uh, which have like-minded uh, value systems and, 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 uh, and beliefs, uh, provided that what we are all trying to do is establish a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. So I think it need, there is a difference, as, as Patricia said, uh, or, or Jan, it's not as if Quad is against something, and certainly that's not India's position. Uh, it is for something. But if the other side sees it as against that should not deter us from proceeding with our uh, uh, objectives if it meets our national interest. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, the title today was Security and Economics, and I wanted to switch tracks a little bit to the economics because as uh, Vijay mentioned and uh, uh, the other panelists mentioned, the Quad actually has a very large and substantive positive agenda uh, on areas that we can cooperate, and these range from 
5G and developing a network of trusted vendors to cybersecurity and uh, using of uh, use of artificial intelligence, collaborating on uh, making vaccines available to the uh, uh, developing countries, uh, making sure that access to critical minerals that so many of today's high-tech industries need is not monopolized by one country and you build resilient supply chains. Uh, and of course, uh, the current shortage of semiconductors we are facing and, and, and again to have a semiconductors uh, uh, supply chain initiative. Barry, uh, Australia really does play a critical role on minerals in particular because you mine a lot of really critical stuff, but most of it gets processed in China uh, and, and gives a disproportionate leverage. Do you see movement over the last uh, year or year and a half in building more resilient, diversified supply chains on this? Um, thanks, Dev Teep. I think the economic argument is important, and I think, Vijay, that in my humble view as the untrained diplomat on this panel, that one of China's grievances with India is, of course, the rise and rise of India. Um, and uh, it doesn't like having another equal, as you, as, you, as, as you say they don't accept, on the block. So I think, I think you shouldn't underestimate that as a factor in, uh, in China. But, uh, Navdeep, you know that uh, Australia was blessed. You only have to scratch the ground. You find a pink diamond, you find coal, you find iron ore, and happily you find critical minerals and rare earths. Critical minerals and rare earths are what are in your phones, in your computers, uh, in, in all sorts of things that uh, protect us and allow us access. And uh, happily, last week we signed an MOU uh, for investment from India into Australia's critical mine and, min and uh, critical minerals and uh, uh, rare earths uh, sector, uh, precisely to deliver on the strongest lesson of COVID economically, which is the need to have trusted partners and secure supply chains. I know that more than 70% of these materials coming into this technology-rich country come from your northern border. Uh, clearly, there is an effort to um, uh, decouple, a word that China also objects to, uh, uh, by India and by other countries to ensure that those countries they're trading with uh, are not going to turn off supply if it doesn't suit them. So I, I think one of the great uh, things that's happening uh, within the Quad, but also trilaterally with, with Japan, uh, with Indonesia, even with France, uh, who we do still talk to, Navdeep, uh, is, is combined efforts in that way that Jai Schenker explained. Find um, strategic alignments, find uh, similar interests, and work with people on those to improve the neighbourhood in which we all live. And... Patricia, I was, uh, you know, within the Ministry of External Affairs, the working groups about Quad, I think some of the work is handled from our America's desk. Uh, and, and, and so clearly there's a much closer coordination with the, the U.S. On, on this. Do you see the working groups that have, <clears throat> have been established making progress? And particularly, I wanted you to um, share something about President Biden's Build Back Better uh, and the uh, Global Growth Initiative of the Europeans uh, as attempts, okay, not to supplement uh, uh, the uh, BRI program of the Chinese, but to at least establish new standards of uh, building infrastructure in developing countries without the uh, attendant issues of indebtedness and the kind of uh, uh, other aspects that we've seen on some of the Chinese-funded projects. Um, so... It's very important to understand that what we are doing is, is not a direct pushback against the Belt and Road Initiative. That's been going on for a long time. Uh, we've, said for, Just lift. we've said for many years that uh, the indebtedness that, that has generated in developing countries is a very dangerous thing. Um, but as far as what we are trying to do in the Quad, we've, we've got a lot of success in um, vaccine, not just development, but in, in donating vaccines. We've said that we are going to have a, a billion vaccines prepared to donate by the end of 2022, which we will hit that target. We've given loans to um, different entities to develop capacity 
um, not just in that area, but also in green technology. That's a big one that we're going to focus on. Um, we, we're supporting uh, with, a, with a loan uh, for solar, which is make solar panels in southern India. We think that this is really a, a critical area to focus on, not just because uh, it's the right thing to do for India, for the region, but because if, if you read anything that's happening uh, with climate change, uh, we all need to get going. And as our special envoy for, uh, for climate change, John Kerry, has said, you know, if everybody's not at the table, uh, we're not going to make any progress. So these are a few of the areas we're working on. And of course, as the U.S., we really like to focus on people-to-people -people ties. So this year, we issued more than 85,000 visas for Indian students to go to the United States. 68% of our foreign students are from the Indo-Pacific, you know, which is not just a wonderful educational and cultural connection. It generates, you know, it generates trade. Um, it generates jobs. Um, I think that they're also in the quad. We have um, decided to uh, sponsor a fellowship, right? That will all the countries will have uh, fellows in different countries, mostly focused on STEM, which comes to the whole. 5G, 6G, semiconductors, you know, uh, the, it's a holistic conversation and I'm not really scientific enough to like sliver one off and tell you this is exactly what's going to happen in this sector, but I, they're all interconnected. And so in supporting one, we support them all. Jan, uh, does the Japanese interloper uh, contribute to these conversations? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think so. Um, so, I mean, on, on tech, I touched on it before, AUKUS, you know, a lot of it has been made about the nuclear-powered submarine element of that, um, which, of course, is also technology. Um, but uh, the other element is the fact that technology is becoming increasingly entwined with geopolitics in today's world. And a big part of the AUKUS plan is also for our three countries to work really closely together on things like semiconductors, where the UK is, you know, it's home to some of the biggest semiconductor uh, companies um, and doesn't manufacture as much as it could yet, but is very crit critical to design. Um, but also, not just these things, things like um, uh, the space area, cyber, all these areas which AUKUS will work together on, but also, of course, the Quad are working together on. And to come to your question, uh, we, don't, we don't actually see any appetite at the moment from the Quad countries to expand the Quad particularly and bring in the UK, but that's fine because we, are, we can work with individual Quad countries or with a couple of Quad countries or with the Quad as a whole on some of these issues on which our values align. And I want to mention the word values because this is not just about developing technologies. A lot of this is also about the governance of tech where I think we all want to play, you know, it's, this is a lot to play for here. How will data be governed? How will cyber be governed? You know, how will telecoms operate? Um, and these are areas our countries to work together on. But also, we are working really closely with India bilaterally on a lot of this, too. We are looking at developing an AI partnership. Um, and a lot of the climate work, we've done a huge amount over the past year because the UK was chair and president of COP26, the big climate conference, we, did, we have done a huge amount with India on climate technology. And also, to go to the point you mentioned, we are working with India to try and export Indian innovations to up to third countries, whether that's in Africa, whether that's in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so I think kind of to bring that all together, yes, it's critical, yes, there's a role for the UK, but also I think this whole region, Indo-Pacific, is a good example of an area where it is ripe for kind of mo um, minilateral engagement. There are small groups, different clusters of interest working on different things. It doesn't have to be a big alliance. It doesn't have to be a big threat to anyone. It's interests of different countries working closely together. And I think that is something that appeals to India um, as well, because you know, India doesn't want to be, you know, India has a long tradition of non-alignment, but it does like to work together with countries where it sees interests. And I think technology is a, a classic example of that. And Jan makes a good point, because I think over the last uh, um, few years, minilaterals are the new flavor of the diplomatic uh, world, where uh, there's a recognition that the existing multilateral system perhaps is not delivering 
as much as it could have or should have. Uh, and, and so uh, it's time for like-minded countries to come and move. Uh, a group like Quad can be more nimble because it doesn't have to depend on a formal secretariat or former. And you can agree to disagree on issues like Ukraine if, if you have to. Uh, Vijay, do you see uh, an alignment, particularly in some of these areas that we've been talking about, everything from cybersecurity to semiconductors to critical minerals, Take India being take, able to take advantage? Because some of these are also curiously part of the Prime Minister's PLI programs and the, and the, the new uh, initiatives for a more self-reliant India that have been put forward. Uh, Navdeep, I think we have to recognize that the Belt and Road Initiative, whatever we may think of it, has allowed China to build very significant influence in the region. It comes with strings attached, but I think most democratic governments who want to win the next election don't necessarily look at the strings. And it's not as if aid coming from elsewhere doesn't have strings attached. So I think Quad has to have an economic element to it. And I think India is critical to that, given its uh, geostrategic location in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and one area certainly where we can do this in Quad is in the underwater domain. Uh, 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 I mean, leave alone semiconductors, submarine cables which carry data, which is going to be the new oil in the world, 95% of the submarine cables and components are built by China. Uh, if some of that supply chain can be shifted to India, India plays a role in the economic activity in the region. That goes for autonomous seabed mining, it goes for underwater unmanned drones, it goes for a whole lot of things in the underwater domain, in the cyber domain, as Jan mentioned, in the outer space domain. So I think, uh, firstly, Quad has to develop an economic uh, perspective. And secondly, the other Quad partners have to look at India in terms of uh, leveraging its geostrategic and geopolitical location and its economic capabilities in order to transfer technologies or set up industry or to allow India also to become an economic base in a way to counter the Belt and Road Initiative, because we have to also build influence in those countries. So um, let me check if the audience is still awake uh, and, and, and uh, turn over uh, uh, questions, comments from the audience. My request to you is we have about 10 minutes. Keep them short and sharp. And if there's a particular panelist that you want to direct it to, say so. Young man at the back there, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sirs and ma'am. My question to you all is that uh, how does Quad seize India's alliance with Russia, especially during the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis and the fact that China has also increased its defense budget? So is there something growing up and how does the Quad basically see this alliance as? Vijay, can I request you to take that? <laughs> so the Quad is just one relationship that all these countries have. You know. Obviously, all the, all the members of the Quad have their strategic relationships with other countries. So we all understand that India has a relationship with Russia that's different from the US relationship with Russia. What we're asking right now is that India try to use the influence and the leverage that they have with Russia, as PM Modi has been trying to do, is to try to end the conflict as quickly as possible in Ukraine. Yes, please. Hello. I think my question would uh, squarely be to Mr. Gokhale. Um, currently, we have seen very recently that China has sort of gutted its uh, ed tech sector. It has uh, brought in those three red lines because of which the real estate sector has suffered quite a lot. Now, was all of this sort of like internal paranoia that Xi Jinping himself had? Or were there certain economic considerations behind this? And what would probably be, in your opinion, the culmination of all these things that he's doing on the economic front. Would China actually come back stronger? Or would it actually start, is it the weakening of the Chinese economy? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I can only give you my interpretation of it. Uh, when uh, Xi Jinping took office in 2012 or 2013, uh, he inherited, of course, an a a $8 or $10 trillion economy but he also inherited all the problems that had happened in the past 20 years. Uh, now, uh, if you look at what the United States went through in the first part of the 20th century when they moved uh, from uh, a sort of 
a few industrial families controlling the, com uh, the country to a more progressive era under President Roosevelt and so on. I guess that to some, at, to some extent, it led to the depression of 1929. And I think that President Xi Jinping has that perception in mind because whatever he may call China, it is capitalism of a different nature. State capitalism, bureaucratic capitalism, you can call it what, it, what you like. He sees the problems he inherited and he is wondering whether they are going along that same railroad to a train wreck. And he is doing what he thinks is good for China to stop it. Uh, and that includes controlling the big tech companies, bringing back state-owned enterprises or giving them a prominence, talking of common prosperity, and so on and so forth. Now, whether he will succeed or not is something I can't say. But I think we need to look at it from that perspective. Uh, because this is, after all, an $18 trillion economy. Uh, and, uh, and not necessarily from the perspective that he's simply trying to control everything. Perhaps he, he may not even be in control of some events. That's my interpretation. Of course, there could be others as well. The lady over there? Yes, please. Good afternoon. Um, so, uh, my question was for Ms. Jan. Um, Ma'am, uh, you spoke of governing technology and minilateral engagement of United Kingdom in that sector. Um, my question to you is, are we looking towards a future where we have a rules-based technological order in the Indo-Pacific region? Um, is that something that we can anticipate, say, in the next coming years? Um, whether, thank you for the question. Um, whether we'll have a rules-based system in the Indo-Pacific region specifically, I think will depend on what kind of bodies are kind of operating in this region, how that evolves over the next period. But we certainly are going to need global rules or rules to which a lot of the, the world signs up. Um, and, I th and that is happening now in a whole load of multilateral fora, whether it's on health, whether it's on trade, whether it's on bits of technology, whether it's on space, whether it's on data, whether it's on telecoms. Um, we do need ro rules to, ha to how we govern this. And I think an increasing number of us realize we need that. And the question is, what are those rules going to be like? What model will they follow? Will they follow the kind of free world model, if I can put it that way, uh, which some of our uh, countries kind of aspire to endorse and are supporting and working for and promoting, or will they follow a different model? I'll just, I'll leave it at that, a different model, which, you know, I think we would think would not be in, in our collective interests. And I think India can play a really, really important role in this as a swing state. India has huge amounts of people, it has huge amounts of data, has huge amounts of skilled people, technology, capacity. Um, I think, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, a, a key proponent of a rules-based international system. So I think there is a lot to play for in which way India jumps on a lot of these issues, and I know that India is looking at all of this really seriously. Barry, you wanted to add something? I just wanted to confirm that that's part of the practical, pragmatic outcome that uh, Quad is working on. All four partners in Quad are working together on those sorts of models that Jan's talking about in the hope they can then be socialised further amongst like-minders around the world. Ma'am, over here. No, behind you. Behind you. Um, I'd like to ask a question of uh, Mr. Gokhale. Uh, <clears throat> the Belgian Road Initiative, it, uh, it wasn't started last year. It started being floated by China a long time ago. Could we have, if you were to do some kite flying, could we have played our cards in a way so that we would have been a better place today? You are telling us, you've told us today what our asks should be now. But could we have been in a better place already without having to ask for things? Thank you. I don't think so, because it was not, uh, it did not evolve as a consensual uh, exercise. Unlike the Indo-Pacific, where uh, the United States has a different perspective, Australia has its own, we do our, we do our own, and we are discussing it. This was a, a, a unilateral decision taken by one country, and everybody else was asked to sign up on it. Uh, now, in our case, apart from the fact that we had problems with the idea itself, we were not part of the idea itself, was the added problem that uh, it was declared that one of the key flagship projects went through uh, a part of uh, Indian territory. And it, uh, it, did, uh, uh, it was a discordant note when that country talks of the South China Sea where India does economic activity as potentially destabilizing, 
and then expects India to accept uh, that country's economic activity in a disputed area where we are concerned as potentially stabilizing to the region. So I think that we were not left with an opportunity, uh, if at all they were giving any, uh, to shape the idea. And therefore, I don't think we could have played our cards any differently. The young man at the back. Yes, please. Hello, sir. My question is to Mr. Gokhale. Sir, uh, do you think that the agenda of the Quad gets diluted by the other members of the Quad itself, members other than India, which uh, and countries like US, which put in, uh, apart from countering China, put in topics like uh, climate change and uh, shift the perspective towards Russia and Ukraine. Do you think the other members they are showing that much commitment towards Quad as is needed today? Uh, I I don't think uh, I uh, uh, share your view because as one of the panelists said, we each have our national interests, but we come together because we share certain values. Uh, you've said, you've talked of climate change. Of course, it's the number one priority for us as well. It's just that we see it differently or we see solutions which may not match the solutions that other people on this panel or their governments are suggesting. But uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't discuss it within Quad or in a larger uh, framework. But I think we must recognize that uh, uh, the Australia, of course, is a major country in both the Indian and Pacific Oceans because its two coasts straddle both. Uh, the United States has been a resident power in both the Indian and Pacific Oceans, at least since 1945. And Japan anchors the Northeast in the Pacific. So these are, uh, no, there is no external power. We have to uh, counter those who, who claim that one or more of these group, uh, these countries is an external power. These are all powers in the region, countries in the region. And uh, the objective they are gathering together is to create a rules-based order. And I think that's something that should be welcome in the region. I don't see that differences on individual issues among Quad members is going to impact the larger trend that is happening there. I think we are out of time. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation. A big hand to all our panelists, please. Thank you very much, Barry O'Farrell, Vijay Gokhale, Patricia Lasina, Jan Thompson, and Navdeep Suri. We'd also like to thank Dhenik Paskar for their support.